The end of the world is a topic as old as the world itself. As long as we have lived, we've realized that this all has to come to an end someday. It is just a question of when, of how, and of whether there's anything we can do about it. There are thousands upon thousands of different interpretations of how exactly it will all come to an end. Some say it ends with a bang, a massive flood, a plague of locusts, a rain of fire. Some say it ends with a whimper, the quiet death of all life, the stars winking out all at once, the world going to sleep one day and never waking back up. So how does it all end? Well, like many great tragedies, Achilles fell by a single arrow, a tiny tremor becoming a deadly tsunami, or a tiny molecule bringing the end for billions. It begins with something small, something seemingly insignificant. It begins with a lock. In 1654, a minor Scottish aristocrat named Sir Edwin Young was traveling across the Mesopotamian desert in search of something most unusual. He was eager to find a new item for his cabinet of curiosities, a room in his home filled with bizarre discoveries from all around the globe. Sculptures of twisted beasts, pickled creatures gazing lifelessly from jars, and jewels plucked from the likely cursed tombs of long-dead royalty. On this particular trip, he found his favorite item yet, which he describes in his journals as a bound jewel of onyx and filigree gold, of finest beyond rational statement. It was found in an ancient ruin, thought to be the temple of a fearsome death god. Though Sir Young seemed to understand the gravity of his discovery, he had no idea what he had found, or that it was yet another world-altering instance of SCP-001. SCP-001 is a complicated topic, one we've covered on here many times before. Every time you think you understand exactly what it means, there's a new curveball coming directly at your face. There are nightmarish monsters, a sun that's turned against all human life, more secret origins for the Foundation and perhaps all life than you can even count on your fingers, a guardian with a flaming sword, a great red monarch hoping to bring an end to all light and happiness in the multiverse, and now there's SCP-001 The Lock, or Quantum's proposal. After Young's death, his descendants donated his collection to the Scottish National Museum. There, a curator named Mr. McCandlish was able to translate runic sketches in Young's notes, identified as tertiary Sumerian cuneiform circa 3400 BCE. Though they could not be fully translated, the words with loss, apchat, ending, joy, and permanence were identified. In 2003, the SCP Foundation discovered the item and brought it in for further study. The lock is a small, smooth, black, ellipsoidal onyx stone with a white pattern that resembles the cosmic microwave background, a pattern of microwaves mapped by NASA that encompasses the entire known universe. The stone is wrapped in complex layers of gold filigree, which cover the stone's center as well as both the top and bottom. At the top of the stone, the pattern of the gold becomes too complex for the human eye to grasp and even defies resolution using a microscope. This is thought to be the keyhole, as it were, or the point at which the lock could become unlocked. The thing about locks is that they tend to hold secrets. They almost always have something valuable to hide, and anything that can be locked can be unlocked, as long as you have the right key. The Foundation tried a variety of methods to open the lock, with no success. Ordinary lock-picking techniques were futile, as were attempts to open it with a hammer, chisel, sledgehammer, bolt cutters, welding torch, or bandsaw. Extreme heat, industrial cutting lasers, car crushers, acid, plastic explosives, and even an atomic warhead had no effect whatsoever. Dr. Hack terminated efforts to unlock the lock, also known as Project Pluto, on the grounds that it was a fool's errand, better at wasting Foundation resources than producing productive results. However, Dr. Mirsky, who took over the research team after Dr. Hack's departure, resumed the project. They should have stopped trying to open it. Perhaps if they had known what was waiting to be released, what APCAD truly meant, they would have. In the lowest, most secure levels of Site-10, Dr. Yara Mirsky held the lock in her gloved hands, feeling its heat pulse through the latex. She was inspecting the intricate gold filigree, looking at the place where a key should fit, and pondering their many attempts to unlock it. Nothing had worked yet, and perhaps that was for the best. Though her colleagues were uncomfortable with the idea of something that could not be unlocked, a code that refused to be cracked, 
She had the distinct feeling that an item that couldn't be opened by even the blast of a nuclear weapon might be hiding something even deadlier. But she didn't have time to finish that thought. A horn blared, shattering her concentration and alerting her to the coming disaster. It was a warning, a sign that something had breached containment. Only it wasn't something trying to break out, it was something breaking in. Hurriedly, she sat down the lock and opened a hatch in the floor, removing a harpoon gun, outfitted especially for taking on powerful anomalous entities. She knew that the Harbinger was coming. There was little else she knew about the thing, but she was certain that it was here for the lock, here to open and usher in whatever would come after. She loaded the bolt into her harpoon gun and prepared for its arrival. Then, all at once, there it was, glowing with brilliant white light almost too bright to look at. It was shaped like a human being, but she couldn't see its face. She couldn't look at it for too long without her head aching. A hundred wings sprouted from its back like a biblical angel, its light permeating the once dimly lit chamber. She was a researcher, not trained for combat, but there was no other choice when she was all that stood between the lock and this otherworldly being. She closed her eyes tight and she squeezed the trigger. The bolt flew and plunged directly into the being's chest. The Harbinger watched her. Though she could not see its eyes, she felt its gaze boring into her as it reached up with one hand and broke the harpoon into pieces like it was nothing. It tossed the pieces to the side, now useless. Not knowing what else to do, overcome with awe and terror, Dr. Mirsky collapsed onto her knees. Cut that out, the Harbinger said, urging her back to her feet. It promised that it would not kill her. As she stared open-mouthed, it produced a small, simple object, a key. Dr. Mirsky pleaded with the being, asking it to reconsider, to think about what might be waiting inside the lock. If the Harbinger had a visible mouth, it would have smiled. It told her that it knew exactly what was inside. It was Apcot, and it would be released. As she watched helpless, the Harbinger pushed the key into the lock and turned. There was a flash of light, unbearably bright and quick. The feeling of everything changed across the world, all at once. Suddenly, the being before her was not a creature of wings and light, but a person. A person she almost recognized, but couldn't. Like the Harbinger had a hold of her mind and wouldn't let her access the memory. Sorry, nothing personal. It said as its form shifted back to that painful brilliance. What did you do? Dr. Mirsky asked. What did you unlock? What's Apcat? The Harbinger answered simply, It is the end. Soon after Dr. Mirsky met the Harbinger and watched it open the lock, a man named Freddie Jones was hunting snakes near Tampa, Florida. A $1,000 prize had been promised to the man who killed the longest python, and $1,500 were guaranteed to the man who killed more pythons than anyone else. Just days before, Freddie had been filling up his truck at the local Gas and Go when he stopped to watch the longest python he had ever seen in his life slither across the asphalt and into the nearby swamp. That was a surefire way to win if he'd ever seen one, and now he was making his way across the wet, springy ground of the swamp in search of his prize. After two hours of trampling through the wilderness, all he had to show for it was a few king snakes and some black racers. No pythons yet, and certainly not the extra-long beasts he'd seen before. He was getting close to giving up, hot, exhausted, covered in bites from fire ants when he saw it. Smooth, scaly skin winding through the underbrush. He'd know that pattern anywhere. He snapped back into hunter mode, trailing the creature as fast as he could. His heart thumped against his chest, and he reminded himself his cardiologist said to avoid strenuous exercise. But he had already come this far. No giving up now. His father hadn't raised a quitter. Above him, a storm was brewing. Thick clouds gathering as thunder shook the ground and lightning flashed uncomfortably close. He had to move fast. There was no doubt about it. His time out there was limited. He was right about this, but not for the reason he thought. He stumbled as the ground quaked, trying to keep on his feet. The python was still in his eyeline, looking longer and bigger as he got closer. He weaved through the tall grass, looking for the snake's head. He took six steps, then six more. There was no sign of its head yet. This thing was even bigger than he thought. No way anyone else was taking home that cash. He felt his stomach drop as he realized he still couldn't find the snake's head. Its body stretched on and on, weaving all around the brush. It was everywhere. 
and it was somehow growing. He pointed his rifle at one side where the snake's body had grown to the size of a horse. That was impossible. He had to have been seeing things, but there it was. He squeezed the trigger and fired, the sound lost in the thunder. The snake didn't even react. It grew larger and thicker, winding around him as he turned in circles trying to track it. He didn't even see the enormous head rising over him, at least until it blocked out the sun. He opened his mouth to scream, but was crushed beneath the body of the massive snake as it slithered through the swamp, crushing plants and animals as it went. Freddie Jones was not the only person to see something strange at that moment, and he would not be the last. A change was coming, and it was coming faster than anyone could keep up with. In South Dakota, the King of the Bears clawed his way up from the earth with paws the size of trucks. A massive beast from the deep crushed a tour boat off the shores of New England. A buffalo the size of a mountain shook itself awake on the Great Plains. Across the world, from above and below and beyond it, something was coming. An unknowable number of things, in fact. Entities from beyond the stars, from the ocean floor, from the Earth's crust and mouse holes in provincial homes. There was some that loved humanity, some that hated it, some that could barely remember what it was. Another was from the SCP Foundation itself, someone who was not supposed to exist. None of them were really, but they all did, and they were all coming to see what would happen next. This story is only just beginning, because it wasn't just one apocalypse that was unleashed with the opening of the lock. It was all of them. Now go check out SCP-001 when day breaks, and SCP-001 The Scarlet King for more apocalyptic accounts of SCP-001.